Good morning. Y'all stand as we worship this morning. seated for just a second you are in the father's house welcome to union point church if you're a first time visitor today make sure you stop by the tent there'll be some folks from the pastoral staff and uh, some folks from hospitality they've got a coffee mug for you and they'd like to get your information so that we know you were here today Uh, they're not going to stalk you or track you down but we do want to just know that you were here today so make sure you introduce yourself out at the under the tent 
guest table. Uh, thank you for being here. As a matter of fact, I like to do this. Would you just turn and smile at someone and just make them feel welcome? Just... They're not going to get smiled at when they go to Walmart after church today, I can tell you that. So it's just good to see you in God's house today. Uh, today we celebrate again the mission of Union Point Church, which is very simple. Jesus said in John 12, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And that's what he meant. He meant about the cross being lifted up. But we lift Jesus up today. And in doing that, we want to lift others up. Lifting Jesus and lifting others. The way the mission keeps going is through giving. And we thank you for your giving. And God bless you as you I told the new members class last week, uh, don't not give what you wish you could give. You ever feel that way? Don't not give what you wish. I wish I could do this. Do what you can. God will bless you. Amen. Amen. Uh, one way to give is through the app. You can give online. Make it easy. Uh, online, you're on the app, you find past and present sermon content, uh, dates, reminders. The app is a good thing. Have download on your phone, tablet, whatever. Um, if you don't, like I said last night, if you don't know how to do it, get your eight-year-old grandkid or kid, and they'll tell you how to do it. So remember that. Uh, there are several announcements. They're going to put some stuff up on the screen. The men's gathering, June the 9th at 6 p.m. June the 9th at 6 p.m. At Chris, I think you and AG are cooking. Blake, somebody's cooking with some, some grill. So it's going to be good. Be here, men. Uh, women, Wine and Design, June the 18th, 7 to 9 p.m. That's a women's event, RSVP by June the 13th. Uh, the Exchange, there you go. They've got a summer workshop, workshop schedule, uh, Sundays in June. And then the Exchange Initiative, uh, there's a schedule. If you want to take a picture of that, if you have a student, uh, fifth grade to twelfth grade, that ministry is for them, and you want to get them involved. In it. So don't forget that. Um, just a, something simple I want to share with you uh, today. Something that was on my heart. Something very simple. I heard Dr. Kenneth Benson say this. He's one of the greatest theological minds that I've ever been in contact with and have ever, ever even heard. And he made this statement one time. He said the three greatest truths that he ever learned, he learned as a child. And they were God is great. God is good. And Jesus loves me. This I know. And I, I, I don't know if you need to hear that today. Wherever you're coming from. Settle it in your mind that God is great. You heard Charlie talk about it last week. He is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's sovereign. God is great. God is good. God is good. Can we say that? God is good. God is good. God is good. How do you explain some of the things that we've seen take place I don't know I just know this God is good and I know this Jesus loves you and he loves me and he's not waiting for you to get better to start loving you because while we were sinners he died for us so take those three truths with you today as we worship as you hear the word go forth just remember those things God is great God is good and Jesus loves me Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here today to worship you. Lord, we, we lift our hands, we lift our voices to worship you. And Lord, when we leave this place, Lord, let, let our love for you shine through to the world that we encounter today. We pray in Christ's name.
you father for that just continue to be with us this morning as we hear your word just be with charlie as he brings it and open our hearts and our minds for what you have in christ's name we pray amen good morning wasn't sure if i had that turned on or not everybody doing all right I had to bring these up here. 
the old man glasses. I tried to go with Adam, and I was starting to butcher up the text so bad. I'm like, I got to bring him up. So, anyway, it's good to see you guys this morning, especially on a holiday weekend. You guys are the real obedient Christians. Well, we're coming in on the heels of a bad week. We've had uh, another school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. And um, just uh, we lift up the family in our prayers for comfort. Um, The first responders, the counselors. You know, last week we talked about a sovereign God. That even in the midst of pain and heartache, that God's up to something. And it's ultimately going to turn into good. If somebody asked me what good's going to come out of this Evalde thing, and I don't know. If I tried to tell you, I'd be lying. But my heart is broken for them. And I know this, is that I serve a sovereign God. I serve a loving God. Just as John said, God is... God is good, and Jesus loves me, this I know. What he does with this, I have no idea. But I have no doubt in the God I serve. I will say this, is that if we as a uh, culture seek our face before God and ask for his discernment and his wisdom and his mercy and his grace, then there's no telling what kind of good can happen in our culture from this. But if we don't, we continue to look under the pillows of other cultures or under the rocks of other ideas, I really just don't know if we have any hope for our culture. But I do know this, whether it comes or goes, I know God's kingdom is sovereign, is eternal, and there's nothing that can shake the kingdom of God. Amen? But with the events that happened this week, it kind of makes you think, you know, why, why do we have to contend with this? And then everybody that reads the news this week, and they're looking at that, and they're like, really, again? What in the world is wrong with this place? And you can theorize all the different things that you think it might be, but bottom line is no matter what your theory is, it's messed up. Bottom line, it is messed up. We're messed up. This world is evil. We are fragmented, contentious people. We put on a good front, but the reality is, is when the pressure hits, the curtains fall, and we get to show who we really are. And outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this world has no hope. Jesus Christ is not the best answer among many. It is the only answer we have. You can go look and try to explain these things through Buddhism and through Hinduism, through atheism, through science. You know, even science, as wonderful as science is, it's only got a limited amount of scope to it. All of the things that are huge that make life life are outside the bounds of science. Science works for us, but it cannot be sovereign. There has to be another answer, and I believe that we have that answer. And we have it in Genesis. If you read the Bible and you skip Genesis, that's like starting a series in the second to the last season and trying to figure out what's going on. Genesis is so important. Of all Scripture, it explains those things. Why are we here? Why are we the way we are? Why is the world the way it is? Where is this all going? Genesis provides titanic answers to those questions, like nothing else does. And so, at the bookend of this series of origins, the first task I've got is that we need to go through those chapters one more time in a recap, as quickly as I can, and then we're going to complete it with the last of Joseph. We'll close this series today. So, are you ready to do that? All right, keeping all of your social media news feed in line and all the news that you've watched on TV, 
have that in your head here. What? Why are we here? What is this all about? The very first thing is that God wanted a family. He created a universe for that family and to share his, the richness of his goodness with that family. Bereshith is the first word in the Bible. It's a Hebrew word. And it's the first word of the first sentence of the Bible, Bereshith bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created. You could also just as easily, probably a better interpretation is when God created the heavens and the earth. You could interpret it either way. You say, well, what's the difference between those things? There is. There's a subtle difference, particularly how you read the rest of Genesis 1. But it's just as grammatically correct either way. Bereshith, beginning. Genesis, the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he created the heavens and the earth from disorder or chaos to order. God's spirit moved on the face of the deep. Tohu vabohu are Hebrew words, empty and formless. It was chaotic. And so what did God do? In chapter 1, he, dis he distinguished light from darkness. And then he distinguished land from ocean or land from waters. And then he began to fill those things. He filled the waters of the deep with, with fish and, and uh, sea creatures. He filled the air with birds. And then he filled the land with creepy things. And lastly, the pinnacle of his creation is he created us in his image and in his likeness from chaos to order. And the pinnacle is, is that his ambassadors, his imagers are created to represent him and his name in this created order. You see, God wanted a family. And that family consists of a supernatural family and a human family. The supernatural family came first. Whether you go to Job 38, Job chapter 1 and 2, Psalm 89, all throughout the scripture, God has a divine assembly. He has a council. Not that he needs help in making decisions, but that he has enjoyed creating a family to participate with him in his rule and reign of this cosmos. You see the first evidence of that in Genesis 1.26. Let us create man in our image, in our likeness. Who is he talking to? It ain't the Father, Son, and Spirit talking to each other because nothing ever occurs to God. All three of the persons of the Trinity already know what the other's thinking. That is his counsel. And that is what his purpose is for us too through the church is to be a part of his ruling counsel, to share his rule and reign in this cosmos with us. And he placed us in a garden, Eden, Genesis chapters 2. And if you want more about Eden, it's also described in Ezekiel 28 as a mountain and a garden. And in Ezekiel 28, you see the supernatural family in that garden. It describes the fall of, if you want to, say, if you want to call it Satan, this is the fall of Satan in, Je in, Ez in Ezekiel 28. But he walked among the stars, as a lot of times these gods are called, these lesser Elohim that are part of God's counsel. He walked among them. And that he fell. So Genesis 3 brings us to the point where the project hits a snag. A big snag. You see, Eden is God's throne room. God has chosen to represent himself and his family in Eden. The entire creation is not Eden. The mandate in Genesis 1, 26-28 or 29 is that man is to go where? Into the earth, subdue it, multiply. He is to extend the garden into the rest of the world. That's why he created us. Take heaven and spread it wherever you go. But what happened was is that the serpent in Genesis chapter 3 was jealous. Jealous of us. I mean, if you were to compare a supernatural being to a human being, the differences are pretty obvious. And so that is a weakness. Wouldn't you like to become like us? Did God really say? Surely 
He doesn't want you to become like him and the rest of us. He wants to keep you down. That sound kind of familiar? He's going to keep you down. You can't trust him. He doesn't have your best interest in mind. You're going to have to take matters into your own hands, which they did. And they fell. You see, Adam and Eve were not immortal initially. God gives life. God preserves life. In the presence of God is eternal life. Outside the presence of God is no life or decay. And what happened was, is that as a result of that, God had banished them from the, from the council and banished them from the garden. The mandate to go out and subdue the earth still remained as a mandate, but they were going to have to do it on their own, which would mean toil and heartache and pain and death. So the first thing is, why is there death? There's death because humanity in the garden decided they knew better than Yahweh. And as a result of that, they were banished and they inherited death. Paul says is that through sin came death. And death comes to all men. So it, why do people die? Why, is, why do we have to contend with that? Well, that's why. Genesis 3 tells us that. But if you ask an evangelical, why is the world the way it is, they'll go immediately to chapter 3 of Genesis. If you ask the Hebrew in the Second Temple period or even before that, or maybe even today, they wouldn't point to just Genesis 3. They would include that, but they would include Genesis 3, Genesis 6, and Genesis 11. If you want to know why the world is the way it is, those are the three chapters that you need to read. So the first one, Genesis 3, is the reason why there's death. The second one is why is the world so evil? That takes us to Genesis 6, 1 through 5. That's the controversial one. For a culture that is raised with Marx, Freud, and Darwin, the idea of supernatural beings coming down to earth, mating with human women, and creating giants sounds embarrassing. That is so far removed from the postmodern mind that it's just like, let's get back into the text and see if we can explain it some other way. And some of them have come up with what they call the line of Seth or that the sons of God are not supernatural beings, they're actually the descendants of Seth. Well, that, that would be great, except it's not in the text. And let's face it, the only reason why we read it into the text is because we're embarrassed. We don't like that. It's too super... Folks, the Bible is full of supernatural stuff. Why are we embarrassed about certain parts of it? Sons of God were a part of God's council. They made a pact on Mount Hermon. Now, the 6, 1 through 5 is just a short summary of a larger story that people who read Genesis chapter 6 would have recognized, and you can find it in First Enoch, and it's that the sons of God came to earth, they picked wives, and they made a pact with each other that they were going to go down to the world and claim it. Why? Because they wanted to bring Eden back, and they wanted to bring Eden back on their terms, not God's. And they knew what the risks were. So they proceeded to go down and cohabitated with women, created Nephilim. But that's not the part that made the world so wicked, as bad as that is. First Enoch tells us that these beings, these supernatural beings, taught us a whole bunch of stuff, really awesome stuff, like warfare, how to make weapons, lust, how to attract a mate, how to attract the other person's mate. How to get what you want through sorcery, magic, reading the stars and figuring out. You want to know what the common denominator is and all of that? How can you use the created order and even God to get you what you want? And what did it lead to? Chaos. Violence. And God looked on the earth and he said, uh-uh. This is not what I had in mind. He floods the earth, destroys everything in it, save Noah and his family. 
But in chapter 9, after the waters subside, he gives the exact same mandate to Noah that he gave to, Je- to Adam in Genesis chapter 1. Go into all the world and multiply and subdue the earth. The mandate had not changed. Do you think for one second that chapter 3 or chapter 6 changed God's plan one iota? Uh-uh. It was right on schedule for him. And so that, you think, well, that would, that's pretty bad. Well, that's not the end of it. Because all of the same motivations that you saw in chapter 6 are now from the human side represented in chapter 11. We want God to be our Pez dispenser, so we're going to build a giant ziggurat in chapter 11 to get what we want, make a name for ourselves. God thought it was funny that he had to come down and look at it through a magnifying glass to see what they were doing. There's purposefully pejorative language in chapter 11 that gives you an insight or a poke in the eye of what humanity was trying to do. And that was trying to make God serve them. And God said, "Uh uh-uh, it don't work that way. But he's a loving God. He's a merciful God. So how does a loving and a merciful God handle a stubborn humanity that wants to recreate Eden in their own, on their own terms that way by using God? He said, uh, okay, if that's what you want, go for it, but not with me. And God disinherited all of the nations. He confused their languages and he scattered them all over the earth. And if you want to know a great commentary on Genesis chapter 11, you'll find it in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 7 through 9, which reads as follows. Old man glasses. Remember the old days, the years long past. Ask your father and he will inform you. Your elders and they will tell you. These things were passed on verbally, generation to generation. Verse 8. When the Most High apportioned the nations at his dividing up of the sons of humankind, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. For Yahweh's portion was his people, Jacob, the share of his inheritance. He basically disinherited the nations and placed them under the supervision of the lesser gods of his council and basically says, you are now representing me in my place to these people. They had responsibilities. They were responsible for these people groups. How well do you think they did? The Bible tells us, Psalm 82 God stands in the divine assembly. He administers judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show favoritism to the wicked? Selah. Judge on behalf of the helpless and the orphan. Provide justice to the afflicted and the poor. Rescue the helpless and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. In other words, do those things that you're not doing. Verse 5, they, that is the gods that he's condemning, do not know or consider. They go about in darkness so that all the foundations of the earth are shaken. God speaks again in verse 6. I have said you are gods and sons of the Most High, all of you. However, you will die like men and you will fall like one of the princes. That's pretty bad. So how does he do it? When does he do it? He don't share that. That's on a need-to-know basis as far as they're concerned and as far as humanity is concerned. I'll give you a hint. He does it through Jesus. But I'm jumping ahead. God disinherited the nations, placed them under the rulership of these lesser gods who had botched it up real bad, And you can see how bad they botched it up by just looking at how the nations botched it up. There is a a natural and a supernatural correlation between these things throughout Scripture. But God didn't disinherit them and say, that's it, I'm done. In chapter 12, he calls a man from Ur the Chaldees, Abram. And he says, I'm going to make you my nation. Through your seed, the nations will be blessed. Which nations? The ones he just disinherited. You see, from the very beginning, God had a plan of salvation 
for the world. Did the world deserve it? No. Did they earn it? No. What did they earn? Destruction. But that's not the God we serve. We serve a loving God. And he planned through Abram to bless Abram's seed. And through Abram's seed, the nations will be blessed. That blessing is Jesus Christ. And so he starts with Abraham and Sarah. They give birth to Isaac, which is a supernatural birth. Let's face it. If you're about 100 years old and you have babies, God was involved with that. I'm not a biologist, but it has to be a supernatural thing for that to happen. Isaac is born. God calls Abraham to sacrifice Isaac at the last minute, tells him not to worry that God has provided for the sacrifice. You see all these clues of exactly how God will bless the nations through even Abraham. And you see it again through Isaac. But you also see God beginning to get his people to, 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 to uh, communicate and to trade and to build relationships with these other nations. So God's rescue plan for the nation starts, which brings us to God's foreign policy. What is God's foreign policy? Last week, we talked about God's domestic policy, which is the transformation of God's love in us and through us, everyone and around us in our environment. That could be communities. It could be nations. God operates and loves to operate through us to transform us and the world. That's his, that's his domestic policy. His foreign policy is, is that he is going to use us to go out and to bring the disinherited nations back to him through Jesus Christ. Okay? That's God's foreign policy. So how does he do it? He does it through what I call the great reversal. Jesus Christ is the great reversal. There is no other plan outside of Jesus to reverse all the badness that happened in, cha in chapters 3 of Genesis, chapter 6 of Genesis, chapters 11 of Genesis. How does that happen? Okay, well, what did chapter 3 in Genesis provide us? You had the rebellion in the garden, and it led to death. We have Christ crucified and raised again on the third day. Christ has been killed, and he has defeated death and rose again. Death is dead. Death is gone for those who place their faith in him. He has taken the keys of death, as Revelation points out. He is now the Lord of the living and the dead. You will never die. Well, Charlie, I just went through a funeral just not too long ago of somebody who loved the Lord. They're dead. No, they're not. You are not a body. You have a body. You are an embodied spirit. When you close your eyes to this existence through physical death, you immediately open your eyes to his realm and you're face to face with him. And that never ends. It may change structure or form depending on whatever God decides to do at the end times and then beyond that. But one thing's for certain is that you will never taste death. Jesus reversed chapter 3 through his own death and his resurrection from the dead. But not only that, Jesus also reversed chapter 6. If chapter 6 is a story about these wicked supernatural beings that disseminate wicked knowledge throughout humanity, then Jesus with his church and through the power of his Holy Spirit, through sanctification and through apprenticeship in Jesus Christ, reverses that. He's teaching us divine knowledge. Instead of anger, hatred, vengeance, lust, he's teaching us about compassion, love, self-sacrifice, forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, he has represented, and he also, through his spirit, provides us the power to become more like him. And as becoming more like him, we reverse, not just him, but through us, he chooses to do that, the wickedness from Genesis 6. Sanctification is a result of Jesus Christ, which is the answer to the fallenness of Genesis 6. So far, so good? What about Genesis 11, where God scattered the nations? 
confused their languages, made a whole bunch of different people groups. Read Acts chapter 2, and I want you to pay attention to a couple of things. In Genesis 11, he confused them, their languages. In Acts chapter 2, people with different languages heard the proclamation of Jesus in their own tongue. And these people came from all over the world. And if you read the list of nations they came from in Acts chapter 2, it goes from east to west, just like the table of nations in Genesis 10. East to west. My east to west, not yours. So you see in Acts chapter 2, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit coming on his disciples and giving them the gift of tongues to reach out to these nations who have been confused and disinherited and letting them know that they are called to come back to God through Christ Jesus. And that is still going on to this day. We're all a part of that same process of reaching out in the world, no matter where the world is or what the people group is, and calling them back to Jesus. Because the na- that God's nation as Genesis 12 tells us, is not a geographical boundary. God's nation is his people, and his people is the church. The church is God's nation. And God's nation is not just here, it's in Europe. It's in the Middle East. It's in Africa. It's in Southeast Asia. It's everywhere. God's nation is all over the world, and God's nation is currently in the process of doing exactly what started in Acts chapter 2, and that is calling the nations back. Sometimes in the major prophets, you talk about all 12 tribes of Israel coming back, but usually it's also coupled with the fact that the nations are going to come back with them. Well, guess what, folks? It's already happening. So Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is the only solution to both Genesis 3, Genesis 6, and Genesis 11. What else needs to happen? Jesus finishing his work, At the end of time, that's about the only thing I can think of. We've got everything we need right now. He's given us even more than we need to do his work. Which brings us to Joseph, because I think Joseph is a great profile of that great reversal. Joseph was an apprentice of Jesus Christ, too. Of course, in the Old Testament, it says Yahweh. Do you know that the, that the Father is transcendent? Whenever the Bible says that no man has ever seen the Father, that's true. Anytime you see God interact with human beings throughout the Old Testament, that's the second person of the Trinity. That's the visible Yahweh. That, was the, that is the second person of the Trinity. That's Jesus Christ. And his apostles would have recognized that. This guy is the visible Yahweh. And if you read about the visible and the invisible Yahweh in the Old Testament, you see Trinitarian language. It's like he's he's one being, but he's in two different locations at the same time. And they seem to have the two different uh, personalities, but yet they're in sync with with the same will. You have like the Godhead already appearing to you in the pages of Genesis before you even get to the New Testament. As a matter of fact... The rabbis in the old days used to have a thing called the two powers theology, where there is, a, there's a, there is a God in heaven, and then there's also a visible God that acts in time and space. And that they're both Yahweh, which is one, but that they're two Yahwehs, which provides all kinds of, you know, same thing with the Trinity. God is one, God is also revealed in three persons. But when Christianity came around, the rabbis decided, hey, you know, this two powers thing sounds a whole lot like Christianity. We're going to have to ax it. And so now you don't see the teaching of the two powers anymore in in rabbinical circles. And that's the reason why. It smacks too much like the Trinity. Anyway, that's a rabbit trail. Joseph, as an apprentice of Yahweh in Egypt, provides a profile of what it's like to execute God's foreign policy in one of the nations that he had disinherited. And we start with the text in chapter 45. Take a drink of water before I read this. Then Joseph was not able to control himself before all who were standing by him. Backstory, Joseph is now going to reveal himself to his brothers. 
looks like an Egyptian, talks like an Egyptian, walks like an Egyptian. They did better in the first service, but it's all right. <laughs> but they didn't know who he was at all. And here he is saying, I'm your brother. You thought I was in slavery. You didn't know what happened to me. Here I am. He says, and he cried out, make every man go out for me. These are the ones that are standing in attendance, the other Egyptians. So no one stood with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept loudly so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. It's your first clue there. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? And his brothers were unable to answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. You can imagine that, right? So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they drew near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. So now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves that you sold me here. For God sent me as a deliverance before you. For these two years, the famine has been in the midst of the land. And there will be five more years where there is no plowing or harvest. And God sent me before you all to preserve for you a remnant in the land, and to keep alive among you many survivors. So now, you yourselves did not send me here, but who? But God put me here as what? Father to Pharaoh, of all things, and as master of all his household and ruler all of all of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, so that you will be near me, you and your children and your grandchildren and your flocks and your herds and all that you have, and I will provide for you there, because there are still five years of famine, lest you and your household and all that you have become destitute. Now behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is I who am speaking to you. And you must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and all that you have seen. Now hurry and bring my father here. Verse 14. Then he fell upon the neck of his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all of his brothers and wept upon them. And afterward his brother spoke with him. Then the report was heard in the house of Pharaoh, saying, Joseph's brothers have come. And it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this, load your donkeys and go back to the land of Canaan and take your father and your household and come to me and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you shall eat the fat of the land. And you, Joseph, are commanded to say this, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives and bring your father and come. Do not worry about your possessions for the best of the land of Egypt is yours. Something happened to Pharaoh. Of course, we know what happened earlier on. He interpreted his dreams. He for, God revealed to Pharaoh through Joseph the seven-year famine that was about to happen. And it blew Pharaoh away so much, not so much Joseph, but Joseph's God, that he put Joseph, who's obviously close to this God, in charge for those seven years. So Pharaoh was touched by the kingdom. Through Joseph, a Hebrew, a foreigner, a slave, a prisoner, now second in command. Actually, I'd say first in command because Pharaoh didn't really have to do anything. Joseph pretty much ran everything. So here you have a Hebrew, part of God's family, who has now been involuntarily displaced from his people and brought into Egypt, which he now rules. Can you see the promises of God starting to become fulfilled through Joseph? So, if God is responsible for this, this is his plan, not ours. It's not Joseph's, it's God's plan. Do you think Joseph had on the back of a napkin all the steps that would be involved with this? I don't think so. He would have probably preferred it to be a whole lot different than it turned out. But yet he could go back and look with 2020 hindsight and see God's hand in all of it. And that by the time he saw God's hand in it, he wouldn't want it any other way. But Joseph, just like us, is also an agent. He's responsible. 
God's sovereign. You're responsible. How do you reconcile those things? I can't. You just have to deal with it. You know, in John, the Gospel of John, it says is that through Christ you can do anything. But it also is inferred from that that if you do nothing, it will be apart from him. So our responsibility is to find where God's working. Seek his face. Stay in his love, his steadfast love, to empower us to be able to move and make decisions in that location, in that place, in that environment. So Joseph does that. The first way he does it is that Joseph engaged in his culture. The rabbis had a whole lot of problems with Genesis because here's Joseph, who's like a Messiah type, who's dressed like an Egyptian, who's, who's basically called Pharaoh for all intents and purposes. And he's married to a daughter of the priest of On. Now, little backdrop, On was a city where you had two major temples, a temple to Re and a temple to Atum. Those are the sun gods of Egypt. Joseph's wife was the daughter of the head priest of those temples. Rabbis had a problem with that. I don't. Because Joseph was placed where he was placed because of Yahweh. In that Yahweh would be with him and would help him engage with that culture, no matter what it looked like. So he, it says whenever he was brought to Pharaoh out of prison, he was shaven, he was put on good, good clothes, and, and then Pharaoh had changed his name to an Egyptian name, gave him a wife, an Egyptian wife. And then we see whenever the brothers show up, he puts them through this test where he takes this chalice. This is a weird part too. The chalice is what you drink out of and you practice divination, an Egyptian divination. And he stuck it in Benjamin's sack. And then they found it in Benjamin's sack, and the whole idea was is now we got to hold Benjamin. What did he say whenever they caught the, the chalice in his sack? He says, did you not know that that is what I divine with, that I'm a diviner and I divine with that chalice? Rabbi's got a real problem with that because divination is an abomination. I have a theory. I think it's a pretty good one. That may be wrong, but I think it's a good one. Do you think Joseph really did practice divination with that chalice? Or do you think he just drank out of it and made everybody think that he used it for divination purposes? That's part of engaging with your culture too. Sometimes we have a hard time separating culture from discipleship. Sometimes we marry the two things so closely that we forget that we're the ones that are supposed to bless the culture we're in instead of the culture blessing us. You ever heard of wag the dog? The dog wags his tail. Tail wags the dog. Sometimes we wag the dog. Sometimes we let culture wag us. And we, 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 we give too much to culture. And it makes us powerless. It makes us look cool. It makes us sound cool. In the eyes of the world, we may even look successful. But we're powerless. We have to place God first. And it works the other way around. We're following God, staying close to Him in his steadfast love, as the Spirit transforms us into the image of his Son, we become a blessing. We become a blessing to our communities, and the more that happens, the more it spreads. It's like a good virus. It spreads all over the world, which it has. We can't do that if we don't engage with our culture. And sometimes Christians have this notion of the drawbridge moat metaphor, that the Christians are not a part of this world. We're called to be a part of, to be taken out of this world or separated out of this world. So we have this, this vision of pulling up a, a drawbridge and filling the moat full of water so that we keep the, 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 the culture out here and the church in here. Nice and separate. That's not what happened with Joseph. That's not what happens throughout all of Scripture. God has his people all over the place. He has them in Nineveh. He has them in Egypt. He has them in Babylon. Even through exile, God's still at work. 
They're not separate. They engage with the culture that they're in, not to adopt the culture and make it their God, but to be a blessing to that culture so that culture comes to Yahweh. We are apprentices of Jesus Christ so that not that we let the culture bless us because of that, but because of being an apprentice of Jesus Christ, he blesses us and we bless the culture that we're in so that that culture can come to know saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's our job whether it's in your office or whether it's in your classroom. That's what we do, is we engage with this culture. But the second point about Joseph is that Joseph remained loyal to Yahweh. Let me tell you something. I'm going to step on every political toe in here. If, if there's a lot of conservatives out here that cannot separate Jesus from American culture, and that's a mistake, because American culture is not holy. Jesus is holy. American culture doesn't bless us. We bless American culture and make it what it is. Got it? But we have to remain loyal to Yah. We have to remain loyal to Jesus. I keep saying Yahweh because I'm in the Old Testament. We remain loyal to Christ. We engage with our culture, but there are things that this culture likes that we must not participate in. I don't need to go through the list. You guys know what it is. Too many times we compromise our theology, we compromise our ecclesiology to make the culture feel good. We're not called to make the culture feel good. Now, if we do, that's great. We're called to bring the culture to a saving knowledge of Jesus. We're called to transform the culture. Sometimes the folks that don't know God think when we're blessing them that the blessing is actually a curse. Because they're so far away from God, a blessing looks like a curse to them. It doesn't make our job easy. But even through persecution, he's using that in his own economy, his sovereignty, that he's working even through that to make us into the image of his son. And sometimes it can be a very lonely place. Sometimes you don't have any friends on either side of the political spectrum. That means you're doing something right. So Joseph engaged with his culture, and Joseph remained loyal to Yahweh. When you do that, what happens? When you do that, then God displays his power by supernaturally affecting that culture. Look in verse 16. Then the report was heard in the house of Pharaoh, saying, Joseph's brothers have come, and it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, do this and load your donkeys and go back to the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come to me and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you shall eat the fat of the land. And you, Joseph, are commanded to say this, Do this, take wagons from the land of, e to the land, from the land of Egypt to, for your little ones and your wives and bring your father and come. Do not worry about your possessions for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. He's basically giving them. Egypt. If you read some of the other parts of it, Joseph actually handles the rest of the famine by turning Egypt into um, a feudal state. You know what a feudal state is? They come to Joseph and they don't have any more money. So Joseph says, all right, I'll take your cattle and then I'll give you grain for that. They run out of cattle. So then they say, well, you can have our property and you can have ourselves in servitude. Now, Joseph didn't keep any of that money. It went right to Pharaoh. But what happened was, is that by doing all that, to get them out of the famine, they had to become a feudal state. And, all, and Pharaoh owned everything, which kind of sets us up for Exodus, by the way. You see God's hand even in that. But you see, Pharaoh is changed. His heart's changed, his mind's changed. Everything that's Pharaoh's is now Joseph's and Joseph's family. And because of Joseph's God, he's that way. That's the power of God. Joseph didn't orchestrate that. Joseph was just being obedient, and God did that. Sometimes whenever you're out in the world, you're interfacing with your coworkers at the office, or as you're at school, and maybe you're teaching, and you're in a, you're in a school that really, there's a whole lot of things there that don't coincide with what you believe. You're still in the midst of doing things through God's sovereignty that affects where you're at. And you may not see it, 
You may think that you're just a, a, a knot on a log, but you're not. He's not required to reveal to you all the things he's doing through you. And if you're like me, who tends to be a sad sack, he does let you know occasionally just to remind you that he loves you and he's still there. You don't engineer the transformation through programs. Do you think that all of the brothers and Joseph got together before that whole ordeal in chapter 37 and said, "Mm, we need to send missionaries to Egypt. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to kill you, and then we're going to change our mind and sell you. That gets you down to Egypt, and then we can start our ministry. (laughs) Sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? We think like that now. We think we're so smart and so sophisticated that we can take God's place and have it all planned out to get the outcomes we're looking for. And when it doesn't happen... We just make another program and figure out how to do it again. And do program after program after program after program until we're burned out. And about 40% of us become atheists. That's not how it works. You remain in God's steadfast love. You trust Him. You remain loyal to Him. There's great power behind that. Always has been, always will be. But here's a mistake. Sometimes success is our worst enemy. Sometimes when we have the most success, we think, we did it. It's over. We did it. We're there. And and then it's not. I give you Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. And a new king rose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the Israelites are greater and more numerous than us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, lest they become many. And when war happens, they also will join our enemies and will fight against us and go up from the land. And they appointed commanders of forced labor over them to oppress them with their forced labor. And they built storage cities for Pharaoh, Petum and Ramses. You imagine what it's like to have been a part of Joseph's family and he's your legacy. And then all of a sudden you're a slave. What happened? I thought we were in the promised land finally. Nope. That's not the promised land. You were just there for God's purposes in order to help bring some of his disinherited nations to him. Did you know there were a lot of Egyptians that went with the Israelites when God did bring them out of Egypt? It wasn't just Israelites. So the success that Joseph had, the next step was their slavery. And of course, the next step after their slavery was their freedom. God rescued them and brought them well, they had to wander 40 years to get there. Two-week two week travel, 40 years to get there. All of them died except the young ones. I could go on and on. If I was going to create a Bible and a religion, I would not put any of that in there. <laughs> I wouldn't mention that. But I'm glad they did. It makes it more transparent and honest. So they get to the promised land, they take it, they inhabit it, and they're only there for just a little while, and then they screw that up and they go into exile. But you know, God is operating through even exile. He's taken them into Assyria, he's taken them into Babylon, he's taken them into Egypt, he's taken them into Greece and Rome. He's setting up the world for his big plan, and it's his big plan, not ours. But he uses us, and sometimes it's through circumstances we don't like. But you can always count on a good and loving God and a sovereign God to accomplish his, his, his goals and his objectives no matter what. No matter how bad it seems, he's still at work and he's still sovereign. So we never forget that when we experience successes, we ain't home yet. There is a Sabbath rest, as the author of Hebrews says, that is yet to arrive. If there wasn't, then whenever there was a Sabbath rest mentioned in Joshua, we wouldn't need to worry about it. But he does. The psalmist, David, writes that there is a Sabbath rest to come. That Sabbath rest hasn't got here yet. We have to live in the tension of the already but not yet. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is spreading. It's a divine conspiracy, as Dallas Willard would put it. But it ain't yet either. Just read your news feed. 
We ain't there yet, folks. And you know what? Don't get agenda anxiety, thinking you got to make it get here. God's in charge. He knows what he's doing. He's on his time schedule. And it's all good. Even the stuff that we don't understand. He's doing something. Even if it's not external, it's internal. He's doing something with us. His will is perfect. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love never ends. But if there are prophecy, prophecies, they will pass away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. In other words, we don't know everything yet. But whenever the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought as a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I set aside the things of a child. For now we see through a mirror indirectly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know completely just as I have been completely known. That hadn't happened yet. Not for us, but it is going to happen. You can bank on it. So forget about trying to manage the outcomes. As the band comes up, I just want to put this out there to you guys. As we approach the table this morning, we are part of a supernaturally produced body of people. We're the body of Christ. And sometimes we're so bogged down in our work and in our culture and whatever hardships we're having to face from one week to the next, we don't know how in the world any of this fits. I just ask that you pray the Lord give you wisdom and to remind you of his sovereignty and his love. You don't know how to act towards that coworker that's hard to get along with, but he will show you. He will give you the circumstances to do that. And it, pro and it will not be anything you would have managed or, or engineered. Or in your classroom. Just say that you're in the middle of a place that just is so far from God you can't even stand it. You're there. He puts you there. Trust him. You think they're stronger than he is? No. You're dangerous. But not in the way you think. He loves working through you. And he's in the business of miracles. Not just the big ones where the dead rise and the lepers are healed, but he works the miracles in the mundane parts of life. The boring parts that nobody ever pays attention to. He loves them. He loves it because he loves us. He wants a family. And he's got one. And we get to rule and reign with him forever. Remember that. Amen.
Father, that we belong to you. Help us to remember that this week as we go throughout the days. Protect us as we leave in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all have a great week.